do. And um, it's, I think today we run, um, it, it's almost a difficult situation to handle. It's not that we want to say there's no deals. Remember C.S. Lewis said, the way the enemy gets us is there's no deal, no devil, no demons, or it's all demons and devils. And uh, unless there's a healthy balance in what we say, we send people down the wrong road because we need to understand in counseling we're dealing with people's lives. And when you touch the inner mind and the emotion, you're dealing with an area where there's no rules. Because we're all different. What you say to one person, you can't load on another one. And so we do need the Holy Spirit in counseling. Because it is a difficult road. And we live in a day and age where if you do mess around with somebody's mind, it goes wrong, you can might pick up a hefty bill for it. And all kinds of people. And, uh, and so we want to talk about tonight uh, just two things. I feel maybe get the three things may be helpful. One is preparation for ministry and deliverance. The preparation, because not only do we need to prepare counsellors, which Norman talked about, this whole area of, of going through forms. And it is important that if that person doesn't come to your church, you need to get permission from the church they go to before you counsel. Because once you do something, and that pastor or leader doesn't know, you need to understand, I feel, I don't understand, would you like someone to counsel your people without you knowing? And you need to understand, does that church believe in deliverance? Does it believe in counseling? Or what does it believe? Because I, I, I found more damage done when people have come to us, there have been all kinds of conferences, you name them, and have gone back and loaned it onto the church. And the church done a thing about it. If you've been pastoring, you understand that you're dealing with explosives. Because we all hear things through our damaged emotions. That's the problem with relationships. Huh? I've had about, I don't know, 12 or 13 years <coughs> in the office today. We try and keep it down. But when you're dealing with human relationships, a husband will say something, the way the wife hears it is different. Anybody know that? <laughs> it's totally different. That's why never, never counsel a husband without a wife and a wife without a husband. It's fake. Because they give their story and you think they don't live in the same house like they last week. They don't even eat the same table. Because we hear it through our damaged emotions. Because words are different. I can, I can say to you that, that, that you need to walk straight. Now what I mean by walking straight and what you mean by walking straight is different. To my wife and to others in the area when it came years ago in the area of submission, when the word submission was said, it meant prisoner. It means you can't do anything without my permission. And you see that? Because the way I understand words and language is the way you understand it. We have a big problem in, in, in the denominational thing. We're having a gym thing. And, and, and in, in England, I think it's launched quite soon. Now, they're using some words of vocabulary that the human denomination don't know a thing about. Because it's a different, you know, house church have a different vocabulary in denomination. Don't understand it. It's a different vocabulary. And some of the things I hear, I think they don't even know what they're talking about. If they knew what it was, they wouldn't say it because the Constitution denies it. <laughs> so you've got, you've got c c conflict. And when we come to the area of counseling and preparation as leaders of people, we need to have some defined boundaries. You must have defined boundaries and defined accountability. Because at the end of the day, who are you accountable to? And the whole area of, of holding, you know, the sense of confidence is so important. Because, and a lot of people don't often know this, but my wife could not tell you about anybody I counsel, because I do not tell her. One thing we need somebody in the house saying. You know, <laughs> it's not what it's saying. But, but you see, I feel if people know that you tell whoever it is, it's very easy for that person to let slip out without realising. And that person won't trust you anymore. So what people tell you it remains with you. And I'll tell you, my wife can tell you any of the I've never told her. Because I believe that it's important to the person who's talking to me. But they don't know a thing. They may know who I've seen. 
I might, I might talk to her about the person who says, well, I'm, but areas of a confident remain with me and me alone. So I want that person to know that I'm no one knows. Because you're in a church and somebody tells you something, you're in a slip. That person sits in the congregation. When it comes out, everybody knows about my problem. What happens if they leave? Could you face if some of the people in your seat that's in your marriage? Could you stay in the same church? You couldn't handle that. And so we need some, some, some guidelines and boundaries. And Jesus did teach his disciples, when you, if you want to have a, a rule of looking at it, start from, from Matthew 5, 6 and 7 of the Beatitudes. Read through them. There was a teaching of Jesus. And um, 5, 6 and 7 about the Beatitudes. Chapter 8 is about the centurion, the cleansed and lepers, and healing Peter's mother-in-law. By the way, Peter didn't go out and weep profusely because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Some people might believe <laughs> And um, his mother-in-law was healed, and then the discipleship was tested, casting out demons. Chapter 9, the, the paralytic was, was cured, and, and Matthew were called, and the miracle of healing. Then chapter 10, he prays all night, and he chooses his disciples. And um, he gives them, and having summoned his twelve disciples in Matthew chapter 10, he gave the twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And um, further down, he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely receive, freely give. We need to understand the sick need to be healed. Uh, leprosy, which is all forms of skin disease, comes under leprosy. If we talk to a dermatologist, they'll tell you that. Le all kinds of skin disease means cleansing, not healing. It isn't words, it's, it's an application. And the more we've seen as we ask God in Jesus' name to cleanse the flesh of a person, we've seen more healing of skin diseases because it needs cleansing. So sicknesses need healed, be healed. Skin diseases need cleansing and demons need being cast out. They are different operations requiring different faith and different anointings. It really is different. I've found in our church now, in, in our healing meetings, that God gave me word that four people would head up healing something. I was a part of that. And, and, and I've found it's working. We need to see that God sets aside people in the church to have faith for healing. I don't have a lot of faith in anything demonic in area, I wish I didn't just say better, but there you are, what I'm doing. Uh, is a whole area of demonic. I've got faith to believe that will leave. I've got faith to believe that curses will be broken the moment we speak. I've got faith to do that. I've got faith to see mental illness put straight. I've got faith for that. When it comes to healing the sick, I do it. I pray that God gives me a lot. And every now and again it happens quite a lot. But that's not where my gift is. You know, I can, I can, I can't do it now. I used to walk on my hands. It's very awkward, and it's very time consuming. In many ways, don't get very far. And it wears you out, because your hands were not made to walk on. Your feet were. And unless we, in our churches and groupings, begin to understand that we have our place in the body of Christ and stick to it. You show me the men and women across this nation through the centuries, who have moved the world, moved the nation, I'll show you people of one thing. Every time, they were sold out to it. Never did anything else for that. Because I believe God doesn't give you a multiplicity of anointing for different things. People try and do it. And the reason why world-renowned preachers get into trouble, because they move outside that anointing, they get into trouble. Same as Uzziah did. In 1 Chronicles 23, I think. He ran in the temple, and he picked up the incense, and he was going to offer it, and the priest ran in behind him, and said, God has not called you to it. He got angry, he uh, used the incense, and he was leprous. Because in the Old Testament, there was anointing, physical anointing law for prophets, for priests, and for kings. The one who received an anointing for a king was not receiving anointing to do the priestly work. I don't think he's changed. Jesus was the only prophet, priest, and king. That's all. And we live in an age in the church, a mighty denomination, bad as anybody else. We've got evangelists trying to be pastors, and they're in people get in the front door, out the back door. Pastors will not make churches grow. 
in my times. I keep the sheep and getting out the back door, but I can't get in the front door and you'll find it. But we need to, the whole most of the body of Christ. And I believe if this church is a church, it will have within that people who have gifted to do that. And we as leaders we've encouraged that. But when we come to the singing out of the disciples, and we see that Jesus gave, see, every believer has the ability to do those things. Jesus said, uh, uh, to those he said to believe, in my name, <coughs> to those who believe, they will lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. In my name, they will cast out demons. That's in Mark 16. In other words, these signs will follow those who believe, not those who have been to Bible college, not those who have received an anointing for some great preacher. It isn't there. But it's given to those who believe. In my name, in my name, there's, a, there's an anointing for the believer to do the works of God. It's there. And all you need to do the things of Christ is to be a believer and have a pair of hands. If you read it, that's simple, isn't it? Believe and lay the hands. It's that simple. But within that, you need to have a safety measure. Everything in this world that's built, that moves, has a safety measure. You have to have inbuilt safety measures. The high wire, no matter how good they are on the high wire, they always have a safety measure. It's not there because they're going to fall. It's, it's there in case of Because we're not in that. And I believe in everything we do, there must be um, uh, an inbuilt safety measure, so why, whereby we might have a measure. And I want to go through some of the things tonight because I believe it's important that we go through it, and it is for the preparation of the ministry of deliverance. The preparation for those who, who really want to get involved in doing it. And I say this to you the quickest way to insanity is getting involved in deliverance if God has a call. I've seen more people lose their mind and their, and their, their understanding to get involved yeah. in demonology without being caught, I believe it's a specific call. Because the onslaught, it isn't kicking the devil out, it's the backlash you don't get. When I started this, and I don't want to put anybody off, if it put you off, God ain't called you to it. That's a fact. If I can put you off tonight, God ain't called you to it. Within a few weeks, a few months of getting involved in deliverance, my child's life was wiped out in the street, got killed. My wife only got a, a, a life locked, knocked out. We got like road accidents after road accidents. All over it, cars coming everywhere. I tell you. Because I believe the whole area of the demonic is very powerful area. Because Paul says, we are not contending against flesh and blood. Not flesh and blood issues. But against principles and powers and rulers. And we're going to talk about that when we come back sometime and talk about the area spiritual warfare. But that's what we're fighting. And it isn't just human intellect. Because I've discovered that the devil don't fight with the Queensby rules. <laughs> you don't fight that way. And uh, we need to have an understanding. If we are going to get involved in deliverance and uh, use the deliverance, we need to be able to understand. Alright? You can see that? I want to go through a number of things that I feel is important. And they're not in any order. But I believe we need to have a safety net of it. One, understand who you are in God. Because you see, when you get involved in deliverance, the enemy, the <laughs> demons are going to challenge you. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you think you're holy and I am? They'll challenge you. They did to Jesus. Are you the holy one? This is to Jesus, by the way. And they challenge Jesus, they'll challenge you. The demons said. Are you the only one come to torment us before our time? Let me have an aside to that, the same is. I often say, and I thought this the other day, in Jesus' time, it was the demons who were tormented. You understand that? Today, it's the believers who are tormented. But if I'm walking with Jesus, it's the demons that are tormented, not the believer. Because perfect love cast out fear. We need to have an understanding of who we are in God. Because when you get involved in deliverance, you will be challenged. Your faith will be challenged. Your emotions will be pushed to the limit. And there are rules. There are safety rules that we need to observe. Because over the last 30 years, I've been involved in it. 
Every now and again, I drop the guard. Every now and again, I don't give myself to prayer and fasting to it. And I get clobbered. Remember, we're in warfare. And in warfare, people do get hurt. There are casualties. If you don't want to get hurt, don't get involved in warfare. The same. If you don't want to get involved and you don't want to get hurt, don't get involved in a boxing ring. Because you're going to get clobbered. And we need to understand that. That the enemy is not going to take us sitting down, but we need to have an understanding of who we are in God. In one of the scriptures there, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we've been involved in deliverance in the early years, not so much now, praise God, in that thing, other people do it now, but then get attacked. <laughs> and um, we've been challenged. And we found that Jesus was challenged by the devil with scripture. Jesus was, was challenged by the word of God. The devil quoted scripture. And I've seen demons out of people quote scripture. And so we need to be aware of it. And in Ephesians chapter 2, we have the, I feel the understanding of who we are in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. I'm sorry, it's right. It's a blue box of cavalier. It's parked over that side of the road. Oh, it's a senator, is it? Is it blue car? Yes, blue box. Oh, right. It's blue box. Someone's drawing. So, I'm not wrong. So, knowing who I am in God, because the moment you get involved in confronting demonic activity, you're going to be challenged. Your faith will be challenged. Your character will be challenged. Because often there's been a sustained. Warfare is not just one bullet. Warfare is not just one issue. We are dealing, when we deal with demonic activity, the finest way to see it, when you're seeking to deal with it, is guerrilla warfare. With, with all the Russian tanks, they couldn't get them out the hills in Afghanistan. That is the kind of warfare you're dealing with. It's like the IRA. Same thing. Now you don't run out of hit next. You can't cover every area. You can't pray for your family, pray for your kids, pray for you can't do that. So when you're dealing with the area of deliverance and demonic activity, you're dealing with guerrilla warfare. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with that kind of devious mind that's waiting for the weakest point to hit you, where soft target or hard target, they're going to hit it. They're going to come back at us. So we need to know who we are in God. Even when we were dead, in our trespasses, in, the, in the Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, made a, Christ made us alive together with Christ, and we were saved. And he has raised us up together with him, and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. So that's where we are as a believer. We need to know that we're not under the devil's heel, we are on the throne with Christ. We're seated with him. Therefore, when we deal with demonic activity, when we are dealing with it from a position of, of being with the risen Christ, the glorified Jesus, we're on the throne, the devil's under our feet. Unless you have that in your mind when you know who you are in God from Scripture. Because I've discovered when dealing with the area of demonic, there is that sense I've found of, of really, of having done all to stand and to withstand. Because you will be challenged. If you've never done counselling on a long-term thing, you'll find there's a sustaining in that. It isn't just one voice. It isn't just one counselling center. They'll come at you. The people will. They'll challenge you. And it comes with all of that. Therefore, we need to know that we've raised up with Him and we've been seated with Him in heavenly places. That's where we are. We come from a place of victory. I say this to people very often, I never pray for victory, I pray from victory. I'm not trying to give victory to another devil. It was done 2,000 years ago on the cross. What am I told to do? So I was a policeman. A policeman enforces the Lord's being passed in Parliament. It's been passed. You don't think that man with a uniform on, standing in front with 38 ton truck and stop him. <coughs> it's that uniform he wears. It's that helmet on his head with a crown on it. In other words, you've got the throne of England behind him when he says stop. And when you say in Jesus' name stop, you've got the throne of God behind you. 
That's what it is. And it's not just concept, I believe they're understanding in the spiritual realm. I don't remember Mike Costello was here last time. We were dealing with a guy once who had been using unarmed combat. And we knew this was true. But he could kill with a thumb and forefinger. He could kill it. But in seconds, you'd be dead. If he knew how to cut your airline off and your blood run up, you'd be dead. And he kept saying, we started doing deliverance. He said, I don't want to hurt you guys. He said, I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> and his fingers were twitching like anything. <laughs> Then you think, well, I do. Who can run the fastest? <laughs> but because we said, look, we know we don't have the power to take on in our own strength, but we have the risen Christ in us. He defeated you at the cross, and God put him under our feet, and we're now seated with Christ in heavenly places. You challenge that. I'd like to come and show a film here one time called um, The Enemy. Anybody seen a film called The Enemy? It's shown in a royal tattoo every year. It's a film on deliverance. It's a true story on film. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's about deliverance. And the thing is that we are no, in, in our human terms, we are no, we are no contest with the devil on our own. But in Jesus we're more than conquerors. So we need to know who we are in Christ. Do you know your position? Because otherwise that will be challenged. And many people get knocked on the first point. Again, it goes on for that. We need to recognize that delegate authority. We need to recognize that our authority has been delegated. That Jesus gave it to us. He said he gave authority. He gave that as he did in Mark in Luke uh, 10 and Mark 16. He has delegated us his authority. Jesus is now in heaven. He's given to us the delegate authority in the same way. There will be policeman that goes out on the street. He's not acting for his own authority. Remember what the, what the centurion said in Matthew 8? He said, because I'm under authority, I have authority. We've got to come on in a moment. Let me tell you, God's got no mavericks. I've often said that uh, nobody's Lone Ranger, even Lone Ranger, Tonto, he wasn't on his own. <laughs> he wasn't on his own. So we, we need to understand that we have that delegate authority. I do not stand against you, Satan. I do not stand against the demonic activity of my own strength. I know I'm no match for you, but I stand under the delegate authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where I stand. And these are principles, and let me tell you, these are principles good, but one day you've got to use them. You've got to use them. We've got three or four computers in our church. I don't have to use one of them. All the power. Because if you don't, you've got to use it. And there's an understanding and a knowledge. So you need to recognize that your authority is delegated. The authority that the demons and the devil are using is rebel authority. Because you cannot take authority, authority has been given to you. Um, I've known people have gone 40 days fast thinking they get your authority. That won't give it to you. That's time for us. out of God's hands. Because every gift of God is a grace gift that's been given to you. It's a gift of grace, it's a gift of God. And knowing that I've been delegated that, and that, that immediately releases you from the stress. The amount of people have come and done deliverance and have been three or four hours wrestling with them. Listen, if the authority of Jesus can't control the situation in you, you won't have to do it. One of the first encounters I had when I got involved in deliverance when we were in the West End, it was Brian, and uh, went to look probably across the church, and this woman had been brought out to Mental Hospital to be prayed for. And I was probably about 17, 18, 21, something like that, 21, 22. And uh, when in this situation, and I'm sitting there, and this, they said, we're going to pray for our sister. And so she was a bean pole, literally, a bean pole. You know, she weighed about seven or eight stone, and eaten, brought out the mental home in Wally, bring her back, you pray for So they prayed for her. And of course, she went out the floor. And uh, they said, oh, the Holy Spirit's blessing now. Let me give you, I'm going to say some things on the side here. Just because people get slain in the Spirit doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. 
Most people who slay them in the spirit, it's a demonic way of getting you off their back. You'll find it out. If somebody goes out in the spirit, get down beside them and start to challenge what spirit is. You'll have a shock in your life. I tell you, when people say I've been slain in the spirit, they don't impress me at all. Because I've known people get slain in the spirit, lay down for two hours, and get up the same person before they went down. I think if God slays you in the spirit, yeah. you're going to change. If your life don't change after being slain in the spirit, I want to know what spirit we're talking about. I've seen it over the years. And I never allow people lay on the floor. I get them up and get them involved in the battle. Passivity is very dangerous stuff get people into. And I've seen so much of it. I think, well, is our meetings, you know, the, the zenith from our meetings and people being slain in the spirit, is that what it is? Not to me, I mean. What I want to see, does their life change? Life don't change, I don't care. And by the way, in the Church of Jesus Christ across this nation, we've got plenty of chronic fallers. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, if you're standing in line and somebody goes down, do you want to stand up like a wally when the laid down? You're going to go out! You're going to be the only one standing up. <laughs> Not psychology anymore. And I'll have to bring everybody out here and lay hands on you and you go out. Do it. And it's not the Holy Spirit. It's the way you stand there. That's a trick of a trick, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Being filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a daily thing. It's not a once and all thing. I believe there's only one baptism for many fillings. I believe there's only one baptism for many fillings. We're told to be filled. Or be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a daily feeling. And you'll discover that if you get involved in deliverance, ministry, you need to know that daily in filling and refilling <coughs> and overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Can I suggest that you only give people out of your overflow? You give out of your overflow. The overflow of the Holy Spirit. And I do believe that there's a that I found that that before there's a certain prime for people is, is to recharge your own batteries, to begin to move out the Holy Spirit, to worship the Lord in another tongue, start to let it flow, start to flow in the Holy Spirit. And that, that filling and refilling in the Holy Spirit is so important. They were filled and refilled, that constant filling of the Holy Spirit. Because I've discovered that if you get involved in demonic activity and the casting out of demons and deliverance, you'll discover there's a very quick energy loss. It really is an energy. And that's why you need that anointing. We was at um, in the south coast and Norman came with me. And we took a, a, a full gospel uh, teaching over the weekend, Friday and Saturday. And, and I knew in the morning I felt the Holy Spirit flowing. There was anointing flowing. And we prayed about 90, 95 people, I think, in two and a half hours. I never felt a bit tired. And you couldn't do that naturally. You, you try it. You do five people and say you feel. Uh, 95, I've never stopped for two and a half hours. Yeah. But there's a flowing of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be filled and refilled in the Holy Spirit. We need to be done anointed. What I'd like to do tonight before we finish, I'll put myself in a hole in okay? game. I'd like to pray for people, just pray that God will touch your life. And give it an anointing, alright? Here's an important one. Operate under the authority of the local body of, of, of Christ. If you're not involved in the church membership and, and involved in, in real church stability, stay out of delivery <coughs> for the sake of your mind and stay out. Because I know that if I didn't wasn't rooted in the church, that my life wasn't involved, I would not do it. Because it's dangerous. I've often said this, that if this bricks is on a site here ready to be built, anybody can steal a brick, right? Anybody. But you build it in this now, you try and steal a brick from this place, you've got to attack the whole building. You've got to attack the whole building. When you want to have us that wall, it's joined with bricks around there. And I believe if we're going to do deliverance and going to do good pastoral counseling and care and healing, we need to be involved in a local church body and operate under their authority. Because it comes back to principle. If you're not under authority, you can't have authority. Other people try to say to me, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just 
going for God. I just go from church to church. I said, it's not in the Word. It's not in here. You'll find when the early church went out in the New Testament, they were sent out and they were accountable to come back and report what happened. People that wander from church to church and convention and Bible group and other Bible group and they're trying to deliver, they end up in a disaster. Somebody's going to get hurt. Because I believe there is a biblical principle. Remember that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the discerning of spirits, were given to the church for the church. Right? The nine gifts were given to the church for the church. The discerning of spirits. Not for the world, but given to the church. So we need to operate under the authority of the local body of the church. We need to walk in personal freedom and that sense of transparency. Let me just tell you, if you've got any hidden sins, any hidden secrets, nobody knows. Deliverance is like antifreeze. You'll find all your leaks. <laughs> if you think you've got no weaknesses, get involved in deliverance, it'll blow everyone. It really is. It really does find things in your life. So I believe it's a wrap. So we need to walk in personal freedom. Now, it doesn't just say we're perfect. But it doesn't, it does mean that I'm walking in transparency. And there's freedom in my life. Because if you're not in freedom, who do you think I'll try and sell people for? And again, it's not perfection, but it is a sense of freedom. You are walking in that sense of freedom and transparency. <coughs> Remember it says in 1 John 7, and to walk in the light that sees in the light, we have fellowship. One with the other, and then the blood cleanses. Everybody quotes, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. You're quoting out the context. As we walk in the light, that means transparency. It means I see your thoughts, you see my thoughts. You can wear what clothes you like in this room if you turn the lights out. Nobody knows whether you're the best clothes or the working clothes or what. But you put lights on, you find out where it works in. So we must walk in the light as he is in the light. Then we have fellowship. And I believe this. If you've got secret things in your life, you will never be involved in a local body properly. You won't. Because you've got to walk in the line. There's got to be openness and transparency. Everybody talks about revival coming to this nation. If it comes, you'll find what happens if you read the history of any revivals. It's a church, people run out, they can't go with it, and the ungodly run in. Because the world can cope with God, you know that? Church can't. They're so full of condemnation. Can't cope with it. But the world can't. They want God's love and God's grace. So walking personal freedom. And these are just guidelines. They're not tram lines. Not tra tracks, but they're guidelines to say, if I'm going to be involved in the living, these are some of the areas I need to be aware of. Because they're safety nets. And if Jesus sent them out in twos, even go loose to colt, the fall of an ass, mm. to ride on, he said, about twos. When somebody's got this lone ranger ministry, the only one man ministry, I don't buy it, and I don't have, I don't have a lot of faith in it. I've got to be totally honest with you. Very few preachers I know that go through this nation ever sit in the church. And anybody who's not involved in church life, for me, has got nothing to say to me on my church. My people there know. I want to have people in my pulpit who, not, who do not sit in the congregations. I'm not interested. So I don't know what's about. So the one guy who was preaching the faith message at one point I said, you come and do it past and see a few people die on you. When everybody's had a vision, a word, a dream, they still die. Try and cope with that lot. That's when you know what is gone. Because you will have it. We had, we had a young child born prematurely and we prayed, we sought the Lord, days of prayer and fasting, warfare, we, we did everything. And suddenly they brought the child to the church. They had a bottle attached to it, all premature, the lungs didn't grow. I said, the congregation, listen, enough's enough. I said, I said, the young couple, do you trust me? I said, yes, we do, John. I said, I'm going to release this child to the Lord. I said, that's right. And the hours it was with the Lord. Do you know what I'm saying? Prayers can hold people back. I've seen this dozens of times. We need to hear God. Because we're messing around with people's lives. I've seen some most damaging things done. 
in the, in the sense of, you know, laying condemnation on people. Is there any sin in life? And these people are dying. They're dying. Well, I mean, is there condemnation? Have you forgiven anybody? I'm not dying, I don't want that. Do you know why? The church has never taught people how to die well, only live well. We do a teaching, it's on tape by a friend of ours called Handling Grief. If you've never handled your own death, that's a big one. You don't talk about it, you never face it. Until you handle your own death, you haven't handled grief. You have to learn how to go death. How many here have ever done a will? Double chance up, huh? because I've made a will. But God challenged me and my wife to do it. It was a big thing. I tell you, it was very... I thought I didn't take a breath of the other word. What we're going to do now? Who we're going to take care of it? I'll tell you. What are you going to have to do? You know, you have any? Until you've done it, <coughs> it's a big thing. Because none of us know where we're going to go. You don't have to be old, and you don't have to be sick to die. Did you know that? Go to a cemetery. I'll tell you that. Die of all ages, all diseases. Some people die with that. Don't face that. If you want to preach the face message, you better tell people that to die well. Because everyone who Jesus healed, including Lazarus, died of some other disease later on. Right? Lazarus ain't still around. <coughs> Remember this faith? will never deny the facts. It rules them. Faith never denies the facts. They said, let's go and wake our brother Lazarus. He's sleeping. Cheetah said, he's dead. He's brown bread. He ain't coming back again. <laughs> he stopped brown, didn't he? He said, he's dead. He's not sleeping. He's dead. And we need to see that faith will never deny the facts. It rules them. Be careful of living in denial. I've seen people live in denial. And it will tear you apart. Live in reality. Alright, walk in transparency. Have a clear understanding of what the scriptures actually say. Read the word, get into the word. I say to people who want to get involved in deliverance and counting, read the first, uh, uh, <coughs> the Gospels of John through maybe seven or eight times first. Just read the Gospels through. When I did that, I read them through, it takes about two hours for each Gospel to read. Some others take a bit longer. But read it through. Spend two, two hours and just read it through. Get reading different versions. Read it first in the Living Bible, get an overall view of it. Then read it in another. But read it. See how Jesus did it. <coughs> read the Gospels. Because I find this. When I'm confused in the epistles, I always find the answer in the Gospels. I found it. Because Jesus laid it far more clear than anything else. Alright? Understand, have a clear understanding of what the scriptures are actually saying. Many get people get involved in healing and deliverance, they don't even know what scriptures do. Because <coughs> demons will quote scriptures to you. Accurately, which leave a little bit out. Remember? When Jesus was challenged in the wilderness, the devil quoted scripture. Because the devil has been around a long time, and he's been in heaven. Right? He's been raised through. He was the only one that challenged God. And in the book of Job, he's still there, when all the sons of men are coming to the great dedication service, the devil is walking up and down with them. In every healing service, deliverance service, and every evangelist, service, the devil's walking up and down. Most people hear the message, and before they get from the back of the church down here, they've lost it. It's got to be Mark 4. It says those demons come and steal the word. Steal it. But have a clear understanding. What does the word actually say? Get on with a decent Bible study. Get under some teaching where you get to know what the word actually says. Because when you get involved in deliverance, <coughs> Now be careful too that you don't end up casting out manifestations. I don't look for manifestations anymore, they'll give away sometimes. Because enough people read enough books that give a manifestation you want. Do you know the church in Fortnite on these subjects? This conference have done for a week and a fortnight. So they know all the answers now to give the manifestation you want. Don't cast out manifestations, cast out demons. Go for the spirit and get to know in your spirit when they meet. <coughs> 
I don't care whether I see manifestations or not, I know when they go. And that's very helpful. So know when it's to leave. Know when you're, you're challenging that spirit to point to the goes. You feel that no more resistance in your spirit and it goes, it leaves. Manifestations, again, I've seen people manifestation, all the demons, and still be able to say, I'm not looking for manifestations. I'm not looking for a demonstration. I'm looking for change. If people you counsel don't change, what you're doing it for? Right? Mm -hmm. Am I going to be a better father, husband, and church member? If I'm not, what's the counsel doing? Just feeling good? Goose pump also feeling great and going out in the spirit and all this? I like all that. But at the end of the day, if you're a pastor, you want to see those people change their lifestyle. Because that's what salvation is, isn't it? Change your lifestyle. So this whole question of having a clear understanding of Scripture and seek to live a stable life. If people are involved in deliverance and don't live a stable life, you need to question them. I'm serious. I've, I've been around the scene so long, I've seen so many people in deliverance whose life are unstable, they've got no relationship with their husband, no relationship with their wife, no relationship with children, do deliverance. I tell you, you're going to get caught. I don't think anybody should do deliverance if they don't have a stable life. They shouldn't do it. <coughs> because much of deliverance I see is becoming a busybody in other people's life. And the word knowledge is not given to be nosy in people's lives. Not given for that. And so living a stable life, I believe it's important. I want anybody, and some people who are good at doing it in our church, I've asked them not to do it. No one that knows that. So I don't see their life as stable. I don't think they've got a stable marriage. I'm not going to get involved in it. Because you're, you're moving into an area where we need to have a stable thinking. People who are unbalanced don't get involved in deliverance. People who don't have a good emotional stability don't get involved in it because it was thrown all over the place. And these are only guidelines, but they're safety <laughs> And I've seen people get involved in all kinds of uh, 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 misdemeanors through deliverance because you end up listening to demons. And let me tell you, demons don't tell the truth. They're like their father the devil, their master is a liar. He tells lies. He tells you enough truth to have you hooked. Just get you going to. So you've heard me tell a story and Bryn Jones told it many years ago. He was in America and one guy started Manifesting demons in the front row, and one of the young preachers picked up the microphone, went down, and said, Demon, what's your name? This demon spoke out and said, I'm a lying demon. He thought, I'm a winner here, see? You lying spirit, you're telling me the truth. <laughs> and if a lying spirit can tell you the truth, <laughs> crazy stuff. And you'll find the devil will give you a measure of success to pump your ego, then he goes into the kill. I've seen that hundreds of times. <laughs> you see, with a word of knowledge, you know. People need to know when they use the gifts of the Holy Spirit when to stop. Every prophecy you hear, if you weigh it on properly, you can tell when the Holy Spirit stopped to make it go. <coughs> you ever seen that? <coughs> stop, brother. Because the ten penalty you put on the end finished it. We do know. We need to weigh prophecy off. Again, if a person is prophesying continually in your church and they don't have a stable life, you need to question them. Because I want to see where they're coming from. Not the guy with perfect, perfect marriages, but it needs to be that measure of stability. But seek to live a stable life. What is a family life? What is a finance life? People that come to me have been involved in conferences on deliverance. They're, 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 they're in terrible debt. Their minds all over the place. Their kids are on drugs. They don't go to work. They've got no job. They're unemployed. It's not always their problem. So it goes on. I think we need to be have a measure of understanding. Walk in humility. Sorry, brother. Walk in humility. I 
I see that when, when Peter talks about it, he says, clothe yourself with humility. In other words, humility is a protective clothing. It's a protective clothing. Because God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the humble. You see, when you humble yourself, you're doing what the devil can't do. The devil cannot submit to God. So when you humble yourself, you're prepared to have his lead, and he can't handle you. Because humility is not his thing, he's in the pride. Walk in humility. Walk with a sense of submission to those around you. You don't know it all, you're still learning. Having been involved in Delivers now for over 30 years, I want to tell you, I'm still learning. Remember this, the devil does not use any new tricks. All the old tricks still work. He don't bring up new ones. I heard a on, woman on the Open Witness show. Anybody see that tonight? The out-of-body experience. So near the truth, but so demonic. Because you know what was wrong with that program that woman was talking about and after death and our out-of-body experience? What she said sounded right when it denied scripture. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Not my way. When you're, when you're dealing with demonic activity and the cults, you keep what the Word says. The Holy Spirit will never deny the Word of God. Never deny it. Let me tell you too. I do not live on words of prophecy. I live on this. <coughs> and I still believe this is still a more sure word of prophecy. Many people prophesy things, they say, yeah! Some of the things I have promised, I thought, this is sheer laziness. I've made up my business in my own church to start. I've been enforcing it until I find out I'm going to do it myself, and make it done. And that Paul said to Timothy, till I come, give attention to public reading of Scripture. We've lost that in the, in the, in the minute. Many of our Bible readers will say a lot of silly prophecies. I'm sorry, they're silly prophecies. We've got it in here, why not read it? Don't we? I'm not doing it as I probably. The Bible says, don't despise prophecy. I'm not into that. But I believe there's some prophecies, to be honest, we can do it now, if we get people to read what the Word says. Or as we end up, people bring me up, and I say this to them Why should you have a word from me when you've got the Word that's in front of you? So people live on a word. Instead of the word. Now, if you're going to get involved in deliverance, you start moving it in the area of the word and pictures and all that, you're going to lose it. Because at the end of the day, how do you weigh it off? You have to line up the scripture. What does the word say? Because the Holy Spirit would never deny the word of God and never go contrary to them. Never. And if you don't know what the word says, how can you plumb line it? And I've heard the devil quote scripture to me in deliverance that you wouldn't think it was a devil. One in the test of spirit. We're told not to test the doctrine, but test the spirit. Because often the doctrine is right, but the spirit behind it is wrong. That's another area of, of teaching. But we need to know that. We're dealing with the spirit of things. So walk in humility. Submit yourself first to deliverance. That's a fright. Do you want to do deliverance? Submit yourself to it first. Let somebody lay hands on you who you know, trust, and love and got related to see if you need it yourself. And let them speak into your life. That's a fright. To most leaders, they run a half. But you need that. There are at least two people in my life who I see on a regular basis that I allow them to speak in my life. They get my tapes. I know what I'm doing, and I want them to tell me. Because how dare you try and do deliverance and use a word of knowledge on somebody else without first submitting yourself to it? You take the feeling yourself, you feel the exposure there. You won't be so quick to say things. You know what I mean? How would you like to be called out in front of a, a congregation and your sins laid out? How can you go with it? You might do another thing, might it be done to you? So walk in that humility. Submit yourself to first. Submit yourself to counselling before you start doing other people. Sit down in front of a, a fellow elder or somebody you trust and say, will you talk to us? 
We pray for it. Lay down and pray. God faced me with this when I first took here in church over in County Town in 75. And um, we were going through pressure. My wages had gone down from £60 a week in those days to £60 a month. It's quite a drop in weight. <laughs> I mean, people saying money doesn't matter. I've seen people really kill each other over money. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that? I was really throw away over money. Money doesn't matter, brother. What a load of rubbish. What can you do in this world without money? Don't get lectured like for nothing. Someone's got to pay. You've got to have money. You've got to have money to do anything in this world. You have. You've got nothing. You've got to be paid for. We're going through a lot of pressure. You imagine, £60 a week, £60 a month. That was a big drop in wages. We're going through tension and trying to budget and do things right. And one Sunday morning, I thought, I can't preach because I'm going through so much turmoil. I called my wife up front, my children. <coughs> Susan was, was only about 14, 15 now, I think, and I said to her, Go, much you've got children out in front to pray for the church. I'm going to die that way. I can't cope with this. I'm under pressure. Do you know that made that church? So you saw that their leader was able to kneel down in front and say, Lay hands on me, pray. And turn that church around. If you're not prepared to have other people pray for you and speak into your life, then God will give you the right to speak. Because God likes to practice what you preach. And that turned the church around. And that turned the whole thing around. Because we were going through it. And immediately <coughs> we did that, people started coming to me and we prayed for me. And those people were closed before I did that. Totally closed up. Alright? Have a working knowledge of the revelation gifts yourself. Start to move out in revelation in a small way. Now, Everybody wants a revelation gifts to be like Paul came to start with. You don't start that way. I don't prophesy in our church a lot, if ever at all now, because you often frighten other people, because you do it for a long time, moving a word of knowledge. I don't even pray, they know. When we're on a Sunday night, we promise for, for deliverance and healings and that. I don't do it. I let them do it, because if I start doing it, they don't think they're good enough to do it. We have to start somewhere. Before you get a word of knowledge about terminal cancer, I suggest you get a word of knowledge about a headache and see it healed. Start that out. Because that's how you do it. You start from there. All right? Have a working knowledge. Start to move out the Holy Spirit. Start to pray for sin. You need to know the power of the finished work of Christ in your own life. If you have no problems and see God solve them, if you haven't had needs, and see God meet them. If you haven't been sick, and see God solve them. Then you'll find you won't know the power. You may know in the head. Somewhere along the line, what you believe will have to become flesh. Mm -hmm. When I first took the Elam Church up in Canning Town in 74, 75, I said to people here, I said, when I first went there, they said, you know, John, I knew me over the years, you know, we really believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I said, man, we still believe in praying for sick, and God will meet all needs. And I said one Sunday morning, don't tell me my God will supply all my needs. Why, well, you've got money in the bank. Wait until you've got nothing, and they're going to close you down. And you'll find out if you believe it or not. Wait until you're sick. You know why? People said to me, you know, just aggressively, when are we going to see <coughs> signs of wonders in this country? I tell them it doesn't happen, but we've got no alternatives. Yeah. Why do we got no alternative? You've got to believe God. Yeah. Joseph Cobo, a man who's come over, Nelson Mandela's cousin, he has in the country who work with him. And his wife made when well, they really see the dead raised and everything in, in Transkaya. You know what he said to us? John, since Western's people have been coming to our nation, they've destroyed our faith. Because we had no concept before, we just prayed that God did it. Yeah. Now we're reading concepts. Mm. No sign of faith, no work of concepts. You can fill up the floor, no faith, and around with your wife, not put it right, and God wants a miracle. Right? Yeah. This, this is weird. Because faith, no work in God. God always responds to faith. And faith comes, not to crank it up or quote text, faith comes. By hearing God. Not hearing text quote, but hearing God. Because when God speaks about something, you know that faith comes. Faith actually happens. And uh, that knowledge of that finished work of Christ. Know what the word <coughs> is. Remember that it's not.
not an intellectual understanding, but it's by the Spirit. You may know all the concepts. You may have read all the books and got the all the conversation. But unless God sets it alight, unless it's mixed with faith, it remains concepts. People don't often like me saying this, but I believe it's biblical and it's true. The early church got experience first, doctrine second. We do it the other way around. I wonder why people don't. You, you get the doctrine of divine healing. I said, wait till you're sick, you'll find out if you believe it or not. So all the doctrine goes out the window, you know what I mean? Doctrine is right, good and proper, but it has to be mixed with faith. I went to church once and they, they backed me into a corner. They said, we're good evangelical teachers here, John. We're well taught our people. I said, fine. We teach them three times a week, including the children, fine. They said, really? I said, I'm saying all that. They said, why are you saying it? I said, one of your main doctrines in this good evangelical reform church is justification by faith. That's right. Why are your people so guilty? Not only teaching, but it's never become right. The word must become flesh. It has to become flesh. That's a drop from the head, which is important knowledge to the heart experience. It's, it's then experiencing that. I find the best way to get people filled with the Holy Spirit, don't give the doctrine of it. Lay hands on, get filled with the Spirit, give the doctrine second. So I think the doctrine should shape my experience. Doctrine is important because it shapes my experience. It gives a plumb line to it. But you do it the other way around. You get passed by into an Africa. They just get healed. Remember a dear man now by the way by the name of Eric Dando, he's now with the Lord. If I remember Eric Dando, he sent us a gold guy from Newport. Built a fine church how many years there. <clears throat> and in those days in the Assemblies of God, and as far as I know, still in the Illinois Constitution and being withdrawn, is that nobody's to receive the Holy Spirit of baptism without an elder or pastor being there. Now Dan though said, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, filled the Holy Spirit, the pastor's wife was in the congregation and she ran. And she was 15 minutes too late to save the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> filled with the Spirit. How do you know the Holy Spirit don't work according to the constitution? It doesn't work that way. He blows as he wills. But we must know that it isn't just an intellectual understanding. That is important. But we need to know it's by the Spirit. And I believe it's right and proper to say this. Whatever we believe, we're our choruses, our hymns, you may not agree with it, but I'm going to show you this at the moment. Unless God comes good on the evening, nothing's going to happen. Unless he turns up. I can sing in the morning, Sunday morning, as I've done, he is Lord, he is Lord, and everybody's almost glued to the ceiling. Not a minute, no. <laughs> Try it at night. Don't worry, you are done well, this morning, when we sung that chorus, his Lord, wow, people were waving like sheaves in the wind. Do it at night time, it's like a damp squib. You can't make the Holy Spirit do what you want. We need to have an understanding in a day of, of, of charismatic and moving the Spirit. You cannot have a formula for the Holy Spirit. We've got this one, two, three, four. Not like that. You know, this is what you do first, second, third, and fourth. We've got some we're going to baptize, about 15, I think, this uh, the Saturday week. And uh, some say, oh, we, we should really baptize this person, We've not been saved long. Because this, excuse me, in the only church, they got baptized the same day. No baptismal classes. My father got converted in the revivals of the Jeffreys brothers in Barking, in East Ham. And the baptismal tank was never shut. <laughs> they got saved in prayer meetings, youth meetings, Bible studies, and they got saved straight into the tank and baptized. The scripture says they were baptized the same day. We've got the baptismal classes in the morning. Well, it's not in the world. Where's the baptismal classes in there? Nowhere. <laughs> we need to know what does the Spirit say in those situations. Not intellectual. There's no set plan. Time to deal with it. There is no set patterns for people. <coughs> There's no set patterns for it. 
Things you do today won't work tomorrow. You found that out? It doesn't work. What is the Spirit saying to the church? Is it 21 times in the three chapters of Revelation? He doesn't hear, the hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What is the Spirit saying? When um, David Wilkinson came to come years ago, he said how they had spent a million pounds in New York to touch the people of Untouchable of New York. Spent a year and a million pounds, the finest brain, the finest. He said they announced over the radio that they'd found they'd put a million dollars, sorry, a million dollars at the program. This year, 20 years ago now. A million dollars to touch the untouchable of New York and, and the other areas of New York where there was violence and drug as far as they found. And an old lady of 72 years old who had been waiting on God for 15 years, praying for 15 years, God would use her. She heard it, David Wilkins said at 12.30, and at 12.45 says, you go. The lady of 73, unqualified, listen to the Holy Spirit, began to knock on the door, and Dave Wilkins said this, before 7 o'clock that night, she started 1 o'clock, and before 7 o'clock that night, the whole of Brooklyn is circulating. There's an old lady coming round, listen to her. Hmm. From 1 o'clock to 7, a year, a million dollars, nothing. Why? Because if you listen to what the Spirit is saying, when the house church first started, there no platform, no one in the front, set down the circle, right? I was in it on the first one, so I know. <laughs> Who's got a word tonight? And that's more structure than the Anglicans. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You take me to most children, I'll tell you when the prophet's going to happen. I'll tell you when the pictures are going to come. I'll tell you when the praise stops and worship. We've now got to our liturgy. No why? Wins kill. We have to have patterns. Keep it in. Or we don't believe in prayer sandwiches, no. You believe in singing, prophecy, pictures, word sandwiches. <laughs> Still a sandwich. And it comes at the appropriate time. You know, is that? All appropriate. All. It's all stage managed. They wouldn't tell you that, but it's true. Can't do that. There's a few things here. I want to go on in a moment of time. Is there anything of that you want me to clarify, have a look at? Go over it again. Anything of people, please don't be shy of that. Anything at all. Maybe help me down with that. I think you probably if you I've missed something, I think anything. You alright? Yes? Don't be afraid. Anything you think about? somebody give you haggle in your church? They buy a new car and you're seething. 
Next time they drive up, they'll smash up back up front. How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> right, isn't it? Hey? Sin is nice. <laughs> it's nice. That's right. I've heard the most bizarre things talk about sin. You wouldn't think because sin is nice. Because it pleases my flesh. I feel good. I'll be angry with somebody and let it have it. You know what I mean? Really give them a good whack over the head with it. I feel good off <laughs> anyway. I've got that on my chest. I feel good for that. See? Because sin is nice. But the consequence is. So there are things that I believe are going to get involved in deliverance and dealing with demonic activity. There are some guiding principles that we need to look at in a few months. One is, there is no substitute for repentance. <coughs> Deliverance will never do what only repentance will do. Repentance comes before deliverance because repentance will close the door after the spirit has been cast out. So there is no subject for repentance. No subject. <coughs> the man is responsible for his choices and his responses. Man is responsible. If you want to get people delivered and stay delivered, you must get them to recognize that they are responsible. The devil made me do it isn't biblical. The devil can't make you do anything you don't want to do. You heard me say, I think the first time, that the demonic act that at least 6,000 demons, a legion, tormenting him, tearing him apart, breaking chains, before he was prayed for, before any demon was cast out, he came and fell down and worshipped Jesus with 6,000 demons inside. Because his will was intact. Your will is always intact. You always have a choice. No why? Not even God touched that in the Garden of Eden. You need to tell people when every demon is cast out, when you're living under the anointing, Adam and Eve had a perfect situation, perfect. God is a counselor every night. But he didn't help them to be obedient. Because obedience is a choice. Even when you live in a perfect situation, still blew it. They had no sin. Perfection, living in a perfect situation, <coughs> help you to be obedient. It's still a choice. I often say this when people tell me that, they, oh, I can't live a holy life. You should see my family, see my kids, see my work, see where I live. And believe in a perfect situation. It didn't help them to be obedient. Because obedience is a choice. Even when you've got no sin. And they had no sin. They had a choice. All right? Christian life is maintained by an attitude of repentance. It really is. I believe we need to have an understanding that my daily life is a daily sense of repentance. Not that I'm always looking in, not that I'm always believing I'm sinful, but a need to be a humble, a contrition heart, a submit to God's words and purposes for my life when I know I blow it. Every day of my life, I don't want to sin, I don't want to be a bit obedient. But I don't know about you, I'm, I'm just getting together a teaching which is called Breaking the Bonds of Iniquity. We're not aware of things you do. Often you think, oh, fine, I can't get hold of it. You ever heard that? Things that happen in your life, you've done it before you know what's happened to you. Because to all of us, there is a propensity to sin. There's no nature in us that wants to have its own way. If you don't believe me, brother, wait until your wife says, how many times have you got to tell you about doing that kitchen up? You'll soon find there's something in you that says, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> Get off on my back, stop nagging, anybody? I ain't gonna ouch, I don't care, but that's what it is. Because there's something in me that wants my own way. And that word iniquity in the Old Testament, Testament is a perversity. In the New Testament, it's lawless, acting without restraint. That's what it is. And it's in all of us. When you're on a tiredest and people have been getting at you and you feel worn down and fed.
went up with people, the church, God, everything else, is then when iniquity starts to happen. Have you ever seen that? It's when David stood on the roof of his palace and viewed over what he had, he saw Bathsheba. And when great men of God that come through this nation, through the world, start sticking on the roof of their palaces with a big magazine, that's when they get hit. That's what happened. Never stand on the roof of your so-called palace, whatever, and think, wow, and I a great person. Look what's happened. We're doing millions to live to. When I, when I get magazines from my daughter reads that, I think, give them six months, they'll be gone, and they usually are. We must always realise whatever we do in this world, we never touch the glory. It's God, he's the one. Without God, we can't make it. Christian life is maintained by an attitude, not an attitude. Let me say some please again. I believe in the anointing. Listen, with the anointing, you need to be walking in obedience. Because you need to understand this. When anointing flows, it doesn't mean to say you're obedient. I've seen men living in sin. I mean sin. Still have the anointing. That's a twist. Because in some men, they call it anointing. But if those men were selling houses, they still have a good business. If those men were, were selling sand in the desert, they're making pieces out of it. Because that's their personality. There's a lot of what you see around the nation today is, is pure, I see, personality that knows how to make it go. It really is. I want to know is a woman he's traveling with his wife. I want to know that. That isn't usually the case, you don't believe it. I want to know who pays his bills and how does he get his money. Because those are the issues that we all have to run with every day. Maintained by a sense. There is no substitute for self-discipline. People come to me for deliverance, but basically it's self-discipline. Because we end up saying, this is a demon. Like, you know, kicking demons out easy, very easy. It's keeping them out, it's a hard bit. Anybody found that? We're seeing tremendous deliverance. You see, if the people are not walking in a daily walk with God in repentance and understanding and being taught right now what the scripture teaches, you love what Jesus said, you kick one out, there's seven other words come back in. Worse than no substitute for self-discipline. No substitute for it. the end of the day, when every demon has been cast out, when you're totally free, you've still got to live a disciplined life. And unless we get this into people at the beginning, we'll end up saying, yeah, let God touch you, let God zap you, let you have the anointing. And I've seen people, like myself, you have all of that, and you still say, like Paul in Romans 7, a wretched man I am. Who can deliver me? Anybody felt like that? I am. Why do you use me, Lord? Because that's my humanity. <laughs> Many people can't handle their humanity. They really can't find it hard to control them. So right along that, deliverance will never give a person discipline. Deliverance will never give them discipline. People say, well, you cast a demon out, I really got to do it. I say to people this, before you start getting into the area of being cast out demons, you need to ask people, do you live a disciplined life? Do you live a disciplined life? What I would suggest is, is that you pray and fast. Give one day a week to prayer and fasting and bring your life into discipline. If in a month it doesn't go, I like go for a demon. So the demon thing comes last, not first. Is your life in order? I you living a disciplined life? As people think casting out demons brings a sense of order and discipline. It doesn't. You know, I know that doesn't. You get into it, I've seen the most amazing deliverance take place. Especially when people have been involved in astral projection. See them levitate around the floor like a hovercraft. Stand on the wall like a fly. I mean, they stick to the wall like a fly. Walk up the wall like a fly. still get totally delivered, would maintain deliverance, back in again. Because at the end of the day, we need to understand that the body needs to be under the discipline and order of the Lord Jesus. Walk in obedience to God's word. 
And I believe this, if you walk in a distant order of life, you won't need a lot of deliverance. You won't need that. Don't make deliverance to the be-all and end-all. It's part of the whole. Deliverance is important. I'll give to some people unless they have deliverance, they won't be able to maintain it. We need to be aware of what's happening. So deliverance won't give a person this. This thing must be learned. I've often said it to a lot of people. If anybody has a ministry of laying hands on people and giving them the gift of obedience, I want it first. Some people think there's a gift of obedience. They don't say it, that's what they're trying. If you lay hands on me, I really get blessed, I really want to walk with God. I wish it was that easy. You may do what you hear. Wait till you get home and the switch to tell you on and something comes on that's not nice and you know where it's going to go to in that play or television program. Something inside you doesn't want to switch it up. It's then you find out has it worked or not. You don't know if it's worked in me or not. Often the same, not playing. You want to see how real Christians behave, go to a church business meeting. That's where they really behave the real thing. They all the mask on. Talk about winning the world for Jesus, binding the spirits of this town. Just talk about changing the colour of the walls and you'll find out that you've got war in your hands. That's true. And I found in my upbringing in my church, it was the business meeting I saw all people take a mask off. There's one church, the Pentecost church years ago, you really go to that town, I spoke to people, still the people take those churches over. Everybody knows that when there was a split in that certain church and denomination, everybody knows the way up, up the hill, there was healing church at the bottom, healing church at the top, and it's still known to stay in the town where they fought over the grand piano up the hill. Dozens of them saying, this is our piano, it's not our piano, and up and down the hill with it. Everybody finding the gifts until they want to decide who the piano belongs to. See, that's what we've got to deal with, haven't we? That's what we've got to deal with. That tells me what kind of lifestyle you've got. Because gifts are instamatic, but character takes a long time to build. It takes years. It takes years. Deliverance and discipline or discipline must be learned. Paul said, I've learned. I've learned where I stay and be content. What does it mean? The first time it happened, he wasn't very happy. Somehow his flesh began to bow to that. It says about Jesus in Hebrews 5 8, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things he suffered. I thought Jesus knew it all that to learn it. He's your man to get learned. Because discipline has to be learned. And you don't get it right the first time round. Anybody found that one? You learn it bit by bit. You learn about discipline and all your life. And then discipline brings the order to one's life. Discipline will bring the order. <coughs> will bring the order. It's important. They're now finding in industry, they even to fill shelves in a supermarket on 3 level. You know what I'm saying there? Because somebody who's done 3 levels brought their mind in order somewhere. They brought their life into some kind of order. And we need to be aware of that. This whole thing of bringing our mind into order. Discipline brings in order to it. There's a lot of pain in it. A lot of pain. How many people who play the piano will tell you when their mother or father made them have to practice on the piano, they wanted to strangle them. <laughs> when the concert pianist Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Father. What does Scripture say in Hebrews 12? That no discipline is good at the present. Right? No discipline is good when you make it, but it yields a peaceful harvest of fruit and righteousness. It yields something. So I believe when we're, when we're talking about deliverance, we must have this healthy balance. If all we talk about is deliverance and naming them, kicking them out, that's only half the problem. Because when you've done that, they've still got all of their life. So it's far better than to bring all of their life to begin with, so when demons are cast out, they shut the door. You know what God said to Cain? He said, there's no sin door in your life. 
Sin is at the door, Cain. Cain didn't shut the door. He rose up and murdered his brother. But God didn't say to him, this is a demon problem, this is a spirit problem. This is a door, you've got to close. Not I'll close it. Not if you seek me, I'll close it. We have to close every open door. Not always demons, is, is there a door open where you kick the demon out of one end and you've got him in the other door? He said, Cain, there's an open door in your life. An open door. And you need to close it. Close that door. Because I mean, the devil works through disorder. The devil works through disorder. You just tell me that like James chapter 3 talks about wisdom, talks about calm, being on fire. See, in the Tower of Babel, when they were rebelling against God, God confused their languages. What happened on the day of Pentecost? God removed the confusion. So everybody spoke in one language. They heard. What was confused in Babel, Babel was put right again by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Because everybody heard them speak. The confusion was blown away. And everybody spoke in the language. So we find this kind of wisdom. In verse 13. Who is among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behaviour and deeds in gentleness and wisdom. Wisdom. But if you have bitter je jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. For this wisdom is not that comes down from above, but is earthy, is a progression. Earthy, natural, demonic. The wisdom that comes, that's, that's, that's arrogant, that's selfish, that's got jealousy and bitterness in it, you'll find it ends up in the demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. When we move out the kind of wisdom, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then reasonable, full of mercy, full of good fruits, not pushy, unwavering, without hypocrisy. That's how you know what the wisdom is. Anything that takes your choice away, you need to question. Anything. Because God never removed your choice. If you want to do sinful things, you want to murder somebody? And I suddenly eat. eat, eat. You want to commit suicide? That's what you do. Go and do it. That's what you would do. And we've had them. People say, well, if you don't come and pray for me, I'll, I'll top myself. I say, you better do it. Because <laughs> if you want to do it, let me tell you, if you want to, if somebody doesn't top themselves, you can stay them 24 hours a day to go to the loo and hang themselves. See that? I've heard of it. And one, one man looked after his son, he, he said he was going to do it, and he said, I'm going to do Sunday time until finally he stuck his, it's only 14, put his tie over the door and hung himself. And he got him in a few minutes, drunk toilet. Somebody wants to do it, you can't give that to God. You can counsel, you can pray, you can tell him, but you can't stop them doing it. They really want to do it. It's been proved. If somebody wants to kill the Queen, there's nothing anybody can do about it. It may take weeks to set up, but they'll do it. They want to. That's what they want to do. But the wisdom of this mobile is peaceable. You know when people come to your word of the Lord, you feel unsettled. There's no peace in it. Now, if you want to judge prophecy in the word of God, you judge it with this. Is it pure? In other words, what is the motivation for this? Is it peaceable? <coughs> See, somebody can rebuke you with a sense of love and compassion. You feel cut to smithereens, but you feel at peace with it. You feel at peace with it. Because the good news is always the bad news first. That's right, it's always the bad news first. Right. Peace.
peaceable, gentle. You ever know people prophesy and think God's schizophrenic? You ever know that? You know, I love you, my children. God, you feel the spirit out you. Condemnation, wipe you out. God's loving you. Peaceful, gentle, meek, full of mercy. How merciful are you, are you to other people? How merciful are you? How do you think of other people's sins? And how do you think you're out? But the thing is, I get as angry as you do when I see some of the things done. Do you know why we don't often do some of those things? It doesn't get set up right. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, say, lead us not in the temptation. Why? Why should you pray that? Because if it gets set up right, you'll break every one of the Ten Commandments if it gets set up right. Right. The reason why a lot of us don't get the sin because all the circumstances don't come together right. I think I told a story before. But a man came up after a meeting and I said that. And I, tell, I thought he'd going to just punch me in the face. He was so angry. He said, do you mean to say that I would commit adultery? He said it. I said, do you mean to say it? I said, well, I'm telling you, brother, if you've got set up right, I think you're struggling. Don't you ever... I said, look, Joseph, when Joseph got involved with sexual sin, this Polyphus wife, not doing it, the only way he could do was run. Because if you stay, you'll be captured. You can't fight that, brother. If a woman turns it on, you won't stay. I don't care who you are, you will not stay. Why says run for it. Get some running shoes on, start running across the direction. And he was angry, went for me. About three or four years later, I was in the same city in North England. And I didn't know him. Old and angry. He said, You remember me? I said, No, I don't remember me. He said, Well, if I don't listen to you, he said, I've had a breakdown in the terrible stuff. What's the matter? He said, You was preaching in the city three years ago and you said something about sin and if God set it up and don't lead us into temptation or pray every day, pray that prayer every day in the Lord's Prayer. Because everything in the Lord's Prayer will stop you. A lot of things. Thy will be done, Lord. Your kingdom come in my life. That prayer does cover a lot of things. It covers everything you need. Lead me not in the temptation. He said, brother, I've got beyond that you say. He said to me, my wife was expecting a second child. She had problems physically, I had problems. And after about eight months of going to my wife, he said, I slept in another room. I had a row with her, a flaming row. I was it was nothing. Didn't know what it was over. And he said, I left him up next morning, I couldn't sleep one night, so I got an early train. I walked to the station, so angry, this round my wife and the whole relationship, and was under pressure, and all things were going. I got the office an hour, what I used to. The cleaner had been and gone. My secretary came in early. and came to me and said, I've just broke up with my living boyfriend and fell in his arms. He said, in five seconds, we were in your doctrine. I remembered what you said. He said, I fell on my knees and said, God, take my knee. He said, if it sets up right, don't leave the temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Don't leave me the temptation. Lord, don't set it up. I'm weak, don't set it up. Because life is like that. And many things happen in this world, we look at and think, what a horrible thing to do. A lot of circumstances have come together at the same time. That's what happens. That's what happens. So I believe we need to be aware that God works in order. God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. There's a sense of God's peace in the situation. Full of mercy. Good fruits. Unwavering. That's stability there again. Without hypocrisy. In other words, how do you deal with other people's sins? Mm. How do you deal with your own? That kind of mercy. Do you show mercy? It says, when brothers fall into sin, let him who is spiritual go and restore him. You know what the word restore means? You know what it means, the word restore? 
It's the same word in Ephesians 4. It means put back in the joint. It means when a person's sinned, when a person's not walking the line, when a person's got into in all kinds, it's disjointed from the body. And you've got to restore it, put him back in the soul again. That's what it means. Put him back in the function again, the body of Christ. He's dislocated. He's out of the body. He's got into sin. He feels dislocated. Go and put it back into, into something again. That's what it means, restore it. We're to do that. And so I believe when it comes to the whole of church life of discipline and order and deliverance, sin as a whole. Whatever you do, don't just say, I'm going to be, now I know people say this, well, I'm just in the healing ministry. It's not in there. Any healing ministry that's not working with the body of Christ is a danger. Anybody getting involved in deliverance that's not part of the whole church program is going to put the church into destruction and get people in error. It's part of the whole. Deliverance is important. So is repentance. So is discipline. So is being involved in the church body. So is involved in a, in a discipline and order of life. It is about Bible study. It is about times of prayer. It is about being involved in church life. Being responsible. Being accountable. It's part of the whole. And if you get deliverance out of that, you'll get the problems with it. Now I've seen people get involved in all kinds of issues. Some bit. You get beyond that. You know, and Jesus never gave a formula for casting out demons. He just said, in my name, cast them out. The word drive is there. Drive them out. Just command them to go until they go. And make sure you've done your homework with the person first. The person came just a few weeks ago and said, they had a demonic problem, they did. I said, well, I think God's given me a word. Are you prepared for it? She said, yeah. I said, are you living with somebody? She said, yes. So go and sort it out, I pray for you. <laughs> I can sort it out even like that. <clears throat> if a person's living in sin, casting that demon is a waste of time. Again, it's not that they're perfect, it's not that they're doing everything right, but there is a willingness to do the will of God. There's a willingness to obey the Lord. So I find people go to churches and meetings are being prayed for. I was only a child when they came into things which was nine or ten years old. And people that came in those early days to be prayed for, my father used to say to them, you know, you're married? Yes. You live with your wife? Yes. How's your relationship with her? We're not very good. Well, I suggest I pray for you. You've got to go and send you home to get the right with your wife to talk to her. Pray for her. But you don't believe that. Because what we end up, we end up making the healing deliverance ministry more important than the daily living, and it isn't. The deliverance and discipline all that will help me to live right. It isn't just on its own, it's part of the whole. So when people get involved in counseling and deliverance, it's important to see your goal is to get them into wholeness, to live a holy life, because the word holiness and wholeness come from the same root word. To be whole and to be holy is the same root and look through it. So I want to be, uh, live a holy life before the Lord, to deal with sin issues, to walk uprightly, to be a good citizen, to be a good father, mother, to, to be a good daughter and son to their parents, to pay their bills right, to be somebody honourable. That's what we're aiming for. Don't see this as a, you know, <coughs> we're just in deliverance, brother. Is it part of the whole? Is it part of the rest of the church program? We're finding now we've got a, a thing called Keys of the Kingdom. It's working brilliantly. People get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. The two of our ladies are running it and with that. It's brilliant. What they're doing, absolutely brilliant. But when they finish the 10 minute program, they then introduce them to a home group, introduce them to a Bible study, introduce them to a program that will take them on. Because nothing on its own is good enough. Home group is good, but it doesn't supplement for the whole. The same as just coming to Sunday morning church is not enough. It's part of a church program. So when you're dealing with deliverance, 
you're dealing with a whole program of person's life. So you need to be in a body to be able to say, right, I've taken two deliverance. Now when you get involved in one of the elders and get involved in what he's doing in, in, in the home group, put the chairs out for him, pray with him, get a tea and coffee, get them in an order, so but don't see it as I want to get them healed. Yeah, that's fine. But it's only part of the whole. Deliverance is important. But it's only part of the whole. Because we're a whole, a whole we're a church. We're a church. Any ministry, I believe, I don't care what any ministry that doesn't contribute to your church program needs to be questioned. It needs to be questioned. So I want people in our poor in church, I know. I don't know about the lifestyle. Very rarely do we have anybody now talking in our own fellowship and God's blessed in growth. I want to know where they come from. I want to know as you recommend me. I want to know that. Because often what the preacher says behind him, he's got some kind of charisma. You can lose your church. You can lose people on it. Not the thing of losing people is an issue. The thing is you lose them per se from the kingdom. challenged a guy the other day and he told me, he said, what do you think I am? I said, well, I'll ask you a question. Are you a shepherd or a, or a hireling? He said, what do you mean? I said, if a better offer comes up, would you leave that church? Oh, yes, he said. He said, you're a hireling. That's right, isn't it? A hireling goes where the pay is and the numbers and the churches. A shepherd will say, we'll stay with sheep when you're being paid or not. That's true. Because he's a shepherd. A hireling is a better pay better house, better church, better conditions, you'll go. Because it's a hard If you're a shepherd, you're stuck. There's nothing there because God's called you there. So the gifts and the character and the call. Praise God. Any questions on that? Any questions on it at all? Please ask. Don't know at all, but I'm sure some of you can answer what I can't answer. Question, that's all. Praise God. I'd like you to just pray right now. Pray if you'd like, I'd like us to lay hands on you and pray for you. Pray that God anoint you for that ministry. I did promise to come back and do warfare part two. I picked it up tonight. I thought I put it in this thing, but I didn't. I'm giving my word, I'll come and do it. And warfare chapter 2, right? Not spiritual warfare, because again, the whole subject I feel. When you've kicked out every demon in your area, you've still got to replace it with a different spirit. Jesus said, overcome evil with good. In our area, in Canning Town, it was, for many generations, full of inconsistency. And when we dealt with that spirit, because it was a demonic spirit through the generation, through the culture, that was, that was basically inconsistent, we had to replace it with a consistent program in our church. Mm. You've got to replace it with a different spirit. It's the opposite. So where somebody's been at hatred, you've got to replace it with love. Where there's been disorder, replace it with order. Because you have to fill it again with the opposite thing. And in spiritual warfare, we, we seek to say that and teach it. Because it begins at warfare in my own life. Warfare in my family. Warfare in my church. Warfare in my area. There's areas and, and levels of spiritual warfare. But again, spiritual warfare is not talking and shouting the demons for two hours. That's not spiritual warfare. That's, that's Nicol Man's that medium in. That's what mediums do. What do the only church say? Lord, Will you be able to threaten us and stretch forth your hand by the Holy Child Jesus to see the sight of one of them? I believe when every demon has been cast out, what you actually do is to preach the gospel. When Paul went to Mars Hill in Athens, he didn't cast out the demons of Athens and powers out, but he preached the gospel. That's important that we preach the gospel. Because the gospel is the only antidote of sin. It's the only opposite thing for mankind. It's the gospel. 
It's the good news. We must bring blessing to the gospel and bring to all that. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Jesus. It'd be good that in the next week or so we've got together and uh, see what you want to do when you want to go with me. If you need our help in any way, let us know what you want us to do. We can serve you. We can let you have us to serve in the county forms and other material. It might be good if you've got together as leaders and saying, I don't want to go with you here because I believe you can set up a, a pastoral team in your church to deal with these kind of things. It will leave the rest of the church free to get on with other things. Don't bring the whole church into counseling. Don't get the whole church into deliverance. You'll finish it off. Just have a pastoral team. People know gift in the area to understand what deliverance is and separate them for the work of the ministry. Let the rest of the church come with the gospel preaching and winning souls and, and doing the things in the area it needs to do. Don't draw the whole church into it. When we get together and talk, we'll come back anyway and do this one on our spiritual warfare. Finish it off. Thank you, Father. Pray. Thank you, Lord. I just would really just like to pray, just not anything long, but just lay hands on others here come with us and just to pray with you. Not a long thing, just want to pray and that's all. And ask God to touch your life and to really lay that anointing on you. God will just do that and give you that anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Just pray to God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just pray. Deal with fear. Deal with unbelief, Father. We just pray you open up the minds of our understanding. Give us that spiritual understanding that we need to really do what is right for you. Just move by your spirit right now. Move by your spirit.